Hey. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Peplau. Uh, for the record, my name is Nicole Moss. I'd like to, to start first with um, one of your, your first opinion I think you offered, which is that marriage confers physical and psychological benefits on, on married individuals. And when you talk about married individuals in that context, you, of course, are referring to heterosexual individuals, correct? That's correct. And the reason that you're referring to heterosexual individuals is because you don't have data on same-sex individuals for the most part in this country, isn't that right? On married same-sex couples, that's correct. Exactly. And so, a part, and so there have been no empirical studies that have been done apart from this one survey that you mentioned in Massachusetts on whether same-sex marriage would confer the same physical and psychological benefits that you've talked about today and in your report. My opinion is based on many things. It's based on research on heterosexual couples, which I believe is relevant. It's based on research on same-sex couples showing similarity. So it's really based both on that evidence, that empirical research, and theories and explanations about why those patterns exist. So it's based on those, and then it's also informed by this one piece of information that you referred to. And that is the only empirical study or survey in this case that has been done on whether there are physical or psychological benefits from same-sex marriage, correct? As far as I know, that's correct. And similarly, as far as you're aware, there have not been any studies, empirical studies done um, on domestic comparing whether there are physical and psychological benefits from domestic partnerships as compared to same-sex marriage. Isn't that right? Studies comparing uh, individuals in, in, in same-sex domestic partnerships and in same-sex marriages. To see if there would be a difference between the two. We don't know that either, do we? I think we have many reasons to uh, estimate what we would find, but no, there have not been studies of that. And you would agree as a researcher with 35 years of experience that it would be important for us to study same-sex marriage and whether there are in fact the physical and psychological benefits that you hypothesize would exist. As a researcher, I would always encourage us to do more research on topics that I think are important and interesting, and this is no different. Now, domestic partnerships, to some degree or another, or civil unions, do exist in this country, isn't that right? Correct. But yet, there's been relatively little to no, to no studies done on whether there are physical and psychological health benefits from domestic partnerships. Isn't that right? Uh, that's right. And I think the reason for that is that most of the studies on health benefits rely on very large national samples using government uh, statistics. And we currently do not have government statistics of that sort on registered partners. Now, some of the benefits from marriage that you've seen with heterosexual couples, um, and you listed several of them, and I won't go over them now, um, you can't rank or assess which particular aspect of marriage has caused the observed increase in better physical or psychological health. Isn't that right? I've outlined a number of factors, and I think they often work together and work simultaneously. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be able to answer the question, is there one that is of greater importance than the other? I think that, in truth, would vary from one couple to another, depending on their life circumstances. And that's not an activity researchers 
uh, have tried to undertake. And s some, of the, some of the attributes or aspects of marriage that, that researchers have opined may have a benefit, uh, may, may be the cause of the, the physical benefit of, of marriage. One of those is access to health insurance through one's spouse. Isn't that right? Yes. And so to the extent that access to health insurance would be afforded through domestic partnerships, you would expect to see benefits from domestic partnerships. Yes, I think there's no question that domestic partnerships have been an improvement for same-sex couples, that they do confer certain benefits. It is my opinion that they are not equivalent to marriage for a variety of reasons and that they do not confer all of the benefits of marriage, but I certainly would not dispute the idea that there are certain um, good things that go along with registered partnerships. And to the extent that in your view they don't confer all of the benefits of marriage, you can't say with certainty that those aspects that they don't confer are what is responsible for the increased levels of physical and psych psychological health that you've observed in married couples. Isn't have, that right? I have great confidence that some of the things that come from marriage, believing that you are part of the first class kind of relationship in this country, that you are, that you are in the status of relationships that this society most values, most esteems, considers the most legitimate and the most appropriate, undoubtedly has benefits that are not part of domestic partnerships. But again, you have no empirical studies that you can point us to to support that opinion that measured specifically whether there were benefits conferred by domestic partnerships separately from or different from same-sex marriage. Isn't that right? I really uh, believe that we know a lot about uh, the impact that stigma and uh, being second class have on people and have on relationships. And it seems to me that um, being prevented by the government from being married is no different than other kinds of stigma and discrimination that have been studied in terms of their impact on relationships. Now, you talked about the protective effect of marriage, um, correct? And in your expert report, you testified or you wrote that one of the protective benefits of marriage is the fact that it's a legal contract. Isn't that right? Uh, I, uh, I would certainly agree with that statement. Okay. okay. And a legal contract that affords uh, sort of a, a, a second layer in that it's an enforceable legal contract. Isn't that right? That, that in addition to just being a legal contract, it's one that the spouses can enforce in court if need be. I think that isn't exactly what I said. I think I referred to a phrase used by sociologist Andrew Churlin, who suggested that one of the things that distinguishes marriage is that it um, is associated with enforceable trust. That in many kinds of relationships, partners can pledge all sorts of things. I swear I'll be with you forever and forever and that one of the benefits of marriage is that it enhances the likelihood that that trust or those commitments will in fact be acted upon and be uh, enforceable. I don't think the argument is solely about a legal contract. I think it goes beyond that, that people associate with marriage uh, a degree of seriousness and uh, sort of gravitas that leads them to take those obligations uh, seriously. And you have no basis to dispute that many, many individuals who are in registered domestic partnerships view their commitments seriously and with the same level of um, commitment that you would observe in married couples. One of the remarkable things about couples 
is that they're very resilient and that people manage to form high quality satisfying relationships under a variety of adverse circumstances. And certainly many lesbians and gay men without the benefit either of domestic partnerships or of marriage have formed strong lasting relationships. At the same time, it seems very obvious to me that those relationships might be further enhanced and further stabilized and legitimated and valid validated by being by having access to marriage. Now, one of the one of the benefits of marriage or one of the attributes of marriage that you, I believe, testified confer these the benefits of marriage that you've talked about is the, I think one of the terms is called barriers to exit. And the fact that it makes it more difficult for the couple to just split up lends stability to the relationship. Is, is that accurate? Yes, there's a, a lot of literature and theories about the fact that couples stay together not only because they're attracted to each other and want to be together, but also because it might be difficult to get out, that there are various barriers, yes. And you would agree that domestic partnerships or civil unions also create barriers to exit in a relationship? Civil unions without question provide some kind of barriers, but they're not equivalent to marriage because part of what goes on when you get married is that all of a sudden your relatives know about it, your family is involved, people understand you have a new status. Oh, Anne got married. That's different than when you fill out a form and send it in or however you go about it in your state to become a registered partner. It's kind of like a private contract. It's not something that is necessarily understood or recognized by other people in your environment. And they're an important part of the barrier concept. Your relative saying, gee, you know, don't, don't throw in the towel on your marriage. Think twice. Give it another try. And your pastor saying, let's talk about it. Don't split up. Dr. Peplau, have you undertaken any studies to test what the public's perception is of domestic partnerships as compared to marriage? I have not conducted a study on that. I must say, as I've talked to people about domestic partnership, many of them kind of scratch their heads and say, I don't really know what that is. But no, I have not uh, conducted a systematic study. And you don't cite to any in your bibliography or materials relied upon either, isn't that right? Now, one of the articles. Answered, that's right. I believe that's correct. That, that, that's, cor that's right. And one of the studies that you do rely on in your expert report is a study by Kimberly Balsam. Are you familiar with that study? I haven't reviewed it for today, but yes, I have uh, certainly read that study in the past. Dr. Peplau, it's, uh, if you could turn to tab three of your binder. I'm going to direct your attention to the exhibit that's been marked PX, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1143? Yes. Is that the study by Kim Balsam that you relied upon in your expert report? Yes, it's one of the studies I relied upon. And in this particular study, the researchers found that same-sex couples not in civil unions were more likely to have ended their relationships than same-sex civil unions or heterosexual married couples. Isn't that right? I believe that's correct, yes. And in fact, the authors characterized the data as showing a significant difference in the rates of relationship terminations, correct? Um, you know, I, as I say, I have not reviewed that. If you wanted to direct me to a place, I think that is probably correct. Well, why don't you turn to page 112 in the study? Okay. The very bottom of the, the first column. And isn't it correct then that they found or stated that the data showed a significant difference in the rates of relationship terminations, yes. referring to individuals in the civil unions versus those who are not? Yes, that's what it says. Your Honor, I move PX 1143 in evidence. No objection, Your Honor. 
Well, 11.43 is admitted. Now, Dr. Peplau, we, you focused quite a bit in your testimony on the ways in which gay and lesbian couples were similar to heterosexual couples. And I, I want to focus for, for a bit on ways in which they are different. Sure. Um, I want to focus specifically on gay men for a moment. Would you agree that the practice of monogamy in gay male relationships is quite different from the practice of monogamy in married heterosexual or lesbian relationships? What I would say is this. Researchers who study sexual exclusivity or monogamy in relationships um, often ask about two questions. One is, um, do you believe that mon monogamy is an important thing in your relationship? Uh, or some version of that. Um, and the second is, uh, have you been monogamous or have you been sexually exclusive in your relationship? And one of the ways in which um, gay men's relationships differ, on average, some of them do, not all of them by any means, uh, is that a, a higher percentage of gay men say that they do not value monogamy, it's not important in their relationship, they may have an agreement that their relationship does not need to be sexually exclusive. And correspondingly, uh, somewhat more gay men than other groups uh, report that they or their partner have had uh, sex with someone else since their relationship began. So it's important to put it in that context because we sometimes think of um, non-monogamy in terms of infidelity, a breach of faith, but if a couple has an agreement, an understanding that sex with other people is acceptable, then acting on that agreement is not a breach of trust. And I think that's why researchers have found that um, whereas um, monogamy is correlated with relationship satisfaction for heterosexuals and, say, and lesbians, that is, having monogamy is associated with being in a happy relationship. For gay men, there's no association between sexual exclusivity and the satisfaction with the relationship because it's not one of the markers uh, or the yardsticks by which gay men are measuring their relationship. That's not true of uh, most married people, is it? Uh, what's not true is most married people are very unhappy if their partner is unfaithful and it detracts from quality, and the same is true for lesbian couples. And for, and for uh, a sizable part of gay male couples as well. Just the proportions are different. Well, Dr. Peplau, can you turn to tab four in your binder? I want to direct your attention to the exhibit that's been marked for identification as Defendant Intervenors Exhibit DIX 1233. Mm-hmm. Do you recognize this as a study that you conducted with David Blasband as written up in the Archives of Sexual Behavior entitled Sexual Exclusivity versus Openness in Gay Male Couples? Yes, it's an oldie from 25 years ago. And in that article on page 396, you write that available research indicates that sexual exclusivity might be the exception rather than the rule in most gay male relationships. Isn't that right? That's what it says, yes. And then on page 397 you write that for some time the norms of many segments of the gay community have encouraged sexual openness rather than exclusivity and have defined casual sexual affairs as a complement to a steady relationship. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And do you, do you, you wrote it, so do you agree with that explanation for why gay male relationships that practice monogamy are the exception rather than the rule? I began this by saying this is an oldie, okay? And I think a number of things are different now than when this article was written, um, and that we might find different things if we were to redo the study. One is that when this article was written, no one was talking or thinking about same-sex marriage. Uh, gay relationships were much more secretive, much more closeted. Um, it was really a different time. And uh, I think that um, our understanding about the gay community and about same-sex relationships 
was, uh, was less well developed, that we've learned things over the past 25 years. So I'm not in any way retracting what I said. It's an accurate statement in this paper of what I found at the time. Uh, but I wasn't studying gay men in, um, uh, who, for example, had chosen to get married. So uh, what we're talking about really is what, uh, is whether statements like this is true of uh, the majority of gay men uh, would still be accurate, for instance, of gay men who chose to get married. Well, before I move on to, to a more recent article from you, um, first, John, I'd like to move this exhibit in evidence. It's DIX 1233. Hearing no objection, 1233 is admitted. Now, Dr. Peplow, turning to tab six in the binder, an exhibit that has been marked for identification is DIX 1236. Do you recognize this article? Yes, it's a recent review paper I wrote. Okay. Oh, 1236. Wait, I'm on the wrong paper. Sorry. It's tab five? It's, it's tab six in your binder. It's the close relationships of lesbians and gay men, authored by you and Adam W. Finger Hut. Hut. And I have it as uh, 1245. 1245 is what is marked on the exhibit. Uh, is that incorrect? Uh, no, I'm probably, look, I think it's the same, same article, but I probably have a different, the, the defendant stickered. I apologize. It is that, that article, yes. Okay. And it's so plaintiffs. Plaintiffs 1245. 1245. No objection to plaintiffs 1245. 1245 is admitted. Now, in this more recent article uh, that you wrote, you did a study of, of a certain number of gay men who were in relationships, isn't that right? This paper is not a report of an empirical study I conducted. This paper is a literature review, uh, so it's really a summary of the results of other people's research, and I sometimes cite my own research, but it's, an, it's a review paper. I see. My, my apologies for that. So on page 410 of this literature review, let me make sure I'm in the right tab here. Whoops. You reference a, um, I'm looking in the second column about halfway down. You, you, you write about a study and it indicates that 36% of gay men indicated that it was important to be sexually monogamous compared with 71% of lesbians, 85% of heterosexual wives, and 75% of husbands. Do you see that? I do see that, and, and that's a correct statement of that study, which was a study conducted in the late 1970s, early 80s. And would you agree, however, that while we may not know the exact percentages today, that it is still the fact that more, or I should say less gay men, believe that sexual monogamy is important as compared to lesbian couples and heterosexual and wives and husbands in a heterosexual marriage. Yes, I agree with both parts of your statement that this we may not really know or be able to pin down the specific percentages, but I think as a general statement that um, that the percentage is higher uh, or the percentage differs is correct. Now g going back to your, your study that you wrote on sexual exclusivity and openness um, in gay male couples. In that particular study, um, you noted that there was, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a difference between valuing or saying that you agreed with, that gay men agreed with monogamy and then actually carrying through when it came to their behavior, that there was a, a difference between the two. Is that not right? This is a way in which humans are similar once again, that there are heterosexuals who pledge to be monogamous and who are not, and the same is true of some gay men. And in fact, in that study, you found that 
74% of men whose relationships had always been quote unquote closed had nonetheless had sex with at least one other person. Is that not right? It's been probably two decades since I've reviewed that paper. And so if you'd like me to look at a specific sentence or something, I'd be happy to, to do that. Sure, page 407. Okay, wait, let me get that. Okay, thank you. You would agree that that is what you wrote? It, we, I'm not sure where on the page it is. If I'm you, on page 407. Sure. If you look at the very top, the very first full paragraph, second sentence, it says, this is perhaps most obvious in our finding that 74% of men whose relationships had always been closed had nonetheless had sex with at least one other person. Four oh seven. Page four oh seven, yes, Your Honor. In tab four. And what we did in this study was to give participants a definition of a sexually open relationship in which sexual monogamy was not expected and a sexually closed relationship in which it was expected, and then the statement that you're uh, citing is um, an accurate depiction of what we, f you know, is, is what we found. And, and by closed, you meant, that means that the two partners in the relationship agreed that they would be sexually exclusive to one another, is that right? We meant that they had, um, I'm tr what I'm a little vague on at this point is just exactly how we asked that question. But um, the questionnaire used these terms. I assume that what we're, what we're reporting here are men who indicated, yes, according to our definition, their relationship was open or, yes, it was closed. And then um, a question about, presumably, since the beginning of your relationship, have you ever had sex with another person uh, in what might have been a long relationship or a short relationship? And if it helps, on page 399 of that study, yeah. under questionnaire, it, it says how closed was defined. And as I read it, it says, we define a closed okay. relationship as one in which sexual fidelity is expected of both partners, and an open relationship is one in which both partners are free to engage in sexual encounters with other people. Right. Okay. Now, back on page 407, about three quarters of the way down, you also write your findings in this study that all men in relationships identified as having been closed and lasting three years or longer had engaged in sex with at least one person other than their primary partner. Isn't that right? That's right. And the context of this, of course, is that this is a study of gay men in Los Angeles in another time period. It's not a representative sample of everybody. So I certainly don't want to... Uh, deny my findings, but I think it's important to kind of have the context in mind for when and where and how these data were collected. Now, Dr. Peplau, turning your attention um, for a moment to your testimony on the desire of gays and lesbians to marry um, as compared to well, as compared to the heterosexual community. You, you noted that 74% of lesbians and gay men said if they could legally marry someone of the same sex, they would like to do so someday, correct? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to tab seven 
in your binder. Let me explain this exhibit a little bit to you. Um, there's actually included behind this tab two separate exhibits. One is marked DIX2427, and the other is marked DIX2427A. And what the A is, is these are statistics from um, an official webs government website in Belgium. And the official website is in French, so we had the website translated into English, uh, so it would be more readable. And the uh, certified translation is 2427A. Um, Your Honor, since these are official government records from an official government website, we would move them in evidence as self-authenticating. I believe it was disclosed on the exhibit list that was just recently filed. Recently within the last, the last couple of days. If I could conditionally, if we could, Your Honor, so that I could verify that fact. All right, fine. Then subject to that uh, limitation, uh, 2427 and 2427A are admitted. Dr. Peplau, if you could turn also to tab 8 in your binder, and I have uh, similar exhibit, which is DIX 2644, which is a, another set of statistical charts from Belgium, and then 2644A being the certified English translation. Um, and we would, we would also move both of these exhibits in evidence. Subject to the same reservation, no objection. Very well, same ruling. Now, I'm going to have you flip between these two, these two tabs, so... Um, if you could keep them both at hand, and, and let's refer to the, to the English translations, if, we, if you would. Um, what I'd like you to do is walk with me through determining, based on these statistics, what the relative different percentages were of the population in, population in Belgium, the heterosexual population that gets married versus the um, same-sex population, uh, or I should say same-sex couples or gay and lesbian population that gets married? I'm happy to do that, but I do want to emphasize that my research and the scope of my expertise is about relationships in the United States, that I am in no way, shape, or form knowledgeable or expert about marriage in Europe uh, or anywhere else in the world. And uh, as a, a researcher, in order to be able to comment, I can read these statistics, but be, to be able to comment on them or interpret them plausibly, uh, I would feel unqualified to do that because I don't know anything about the context in Belgium. But I'm happy to go with you and read the numbers. Understood. And so, in offering your expert testimony today, you did not do any study of the other countries in the world where same-sex marriage has, in fact, been available to individuals for some number of years. That is correct. Now, if you look at tab 7, the 2427A, if you see at the very top of this chart, uh, there's the first row has years. Do you see that? 1990, 1995, going all the way up to 2008? Yes. Okay. And right under that, there is a, the, the line that contains the total population for the country of Belgium. Yes. And so you would agree that what this is representing is that in 2008, the population of the country of Belgium was 10,666,866. Yes. Okay. And, and then it's further broken down by how many individuals in that population were single, married, divorced, and widowed. Do you see that? I do see it. Okay, so the total number of married individuals in 2008 in Belgium is 4,509,478? Yes. Okay. Now, Dr. Peplau, there are no statistics that we could find that would, from the, the government in Belgium that would uh, indicate how many gay and lesbians there were in the population of that country. Um, would you agree that a good conservative estimate would be 
I think that would be. Well, um, she, the witness has stated that she doesn't have expertise in uh, marriage outside the United States. Um, obviously, the numbers are what the numbers are. Certainly. I'll let you explore this, and we'll see where we're going with it. I, do you have um, do you have a estimate of what the percentage would be of the population in the United States that's gay and lesbian? I the estimate that I would use would be something like um, two to three percent who, ident who identify as gay or lesbian. So who on a survey, if you said what's your sexual orientation, would check a box that said homosexual or gay or lesbian. And from what you know of your study of sexual orientation, is there any reason to believe that there would be remarkably different percentages outside of the United States? There might well be. That is the extent uh, people's willingness to disclose, uh, in this case it looks like in a government document, their sexual orientation might well vary from country to country. Uh, and so I really don't, I don't know. And so it could be more than 2%. It could be more, it could be less. It could be less. And so, would you, so if, if we just take as a conservative estimate for the point of this hypothesis 2%, would, would that be, can we work with that? Would you agree that that seems reasonable? Um, I, if we assume that the percent is the same in Belgium, that it might be in the United States, my guesstimate for the United States would be uh, that, you know, something like 2%. And, and Dr. Peplow, I'm not offering this as evidence that it's 2%. I don't know either. I'm asking just assume as an estimate. Ms. Moss is asking you to uh, uh, base your testimony on a hypothetical. So if 2% of the population were uh, in Belgium were gay or lesbian, then as I do the math, 2% would mean that there are 213,337 individuals in that country. And I don't expect you to do the math right here, but I represent to you that I've done it and that that is the number. Does that sound reasonable to you? Fine. Okay. Now, because we don't know from this whether when, when the, they're accounting for married individuals, whether that includes same-sex marriage or not in the total marriage figure, um, assuming it does, if we um, separate out, um, if we... I'm sorry, strike that. I'm, I've gotten ahead of myself. Um, I actually need you to turn to DIX 2644. Yes. And this is the chart from the Belgian government website that actually lists the number of heterosexual marriages by individual for each year. Um, that doesn't correspond to the wait. Which, which am I turning to? 2644A, behind tab 8. Title, oh. is, title says trend in homosexual marriages. I'm sorry, did I say heterosexual marriages? Yeah. Yes. I apologize, I meant homosexual okay. marriages. Okay, then I'm with you. Okay, you're with me. Apologize for that. And if you will see it, it breaks it down by men, women, and then there's a total on the far right-hand side. Yes. And it's broken down by year. So in 2004, it reports there are 2,138 individuals who are in a same-sex marriage. Do you see that? I do, and I'm, what I'm not clear about, is that the number of people who got married that year or who reported that they were married? I believe it's the number of married individuals as identified by the state as being married, as by the government of Belgium as being married. So there were fewer married homosexual couples in 2008 than there were in 2007. So there were 2,300 in 2007, but there were only 2,100 in 2008. It's the, no, it's the total number that year. I'm sorry, it's the total number that year. Who got married yes, that year. But, okay. but it's individuals as opposed to marriages. That, 
If you look right above, it says the marital status notices do not yet distinguish between homosexual and heterosexual marriages. The National Registry therefore provides statistics about the number of I people see. married, not the number of marriages. So these are individuals who got married that year. So that number is twice as large as the number of marriages? Yes. All right. And so if you wanted to know how many individuals at the end of 2008 were in fact same heteros or homosexuals were married at the end of 2008, you'd have to add up 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. Okay, got it. And in doing that, and in doing that, it comes up with a total number of 10,923. And again, I don't expect you to do the math in your head, but that would be 10,923 individuals who were married. And this would overestimate potentially the number of marriages because, of course, it's not taking into account deaths or divorce or, or anything else. Um, wouldn't you agree? If I'm representing yeah, to you that it's just the number that reported being married, I'm not asking you to assume right. that any got divorced or died. Right. And based on those assumptions, it would, well, it could possibly be an overrepresentation. Okay. Now, if you take the total number of married individuals that are reported in Belgium, which we looked at earlier on DX2427, and then you subtract out the total number of same-sex married individuals, you would agree that would give us the number of opposite-sex marriages. I believe so, yes. And then would you agree that to determine what percentage of the gay and lesbian population are married, that you would divide the number in the population of gay and lesbian individuals into the number of gay and lesbians who are married to come up with a percentage. Can I, I I'm just puzzled about one thing here that maybe you can help me with, because I, you know, you can do the math better than sure. I can, but I thought we said that on the first table, that in 2008, there were 10 million marriages total. But that the table for the same, for the homosexual marriages is the number per year. Am I right about that? For the, 10 million was the population, the total number. I mean, the, the number of married people is 45, 4 million, 500, whatever. Correct. And change. And that's the total overall, everybody married in Belgium. Correct. And then you're suggesting that it's about 10,000 same-sex couples. No, 10,000 individuals. And okay. So that would be 5,000 5, 5, co couples? Oh, yes. But if, if we just want to know on an individual basis what is the percentage of gay and straight individuals in Belgium who are in same-sex marriages, if you divide the number of individuals who are gay and lesbian that report being married into, so if you basically divide that by the total population of gay and lesbians, you come up with approximately 5%. You know, may I object? Dr. Kepler is not an economist, and she's not a demographer, and she's not studied Belgium, so I don't know of what probativity or usefulness this is with her. Maybe it would be helpful, Ms. Moss, if you uh, ask the bottom line question. Sure. Assuming my math is correct, and I understand as you sit there, you're not going to be able to do it all. I wouldn't be able to do it in my head. I'm assuming you can't do it in your head. But if the bottom line, if the numbers show that 5% of gay and lesbian individuals have taken advantage of same-sex marriage in Belgium, and 43% of heterosexuals have taken advantage of marriage in Belgium, there would be a significant difference between those two, would there not? 
Absolutely. And without taking you through the same, um, without taking you through the same um, process, we also have data for the Netherlands. But can I, can I just make sure I'm with you on, on these data? I mean, what you, you're not saying that only 5% of all the homosexuals in Belgium got married ra because we don't know how many homosexuals there are. Rather, what you're saying is of all married individuals in Belgium, only 5% of them are homosexual? No, I'm saying that 5% of homosexuals in Belgium got married. And, and how is it that we know the number of homosexuals in Belgium? I asked you to assume a conservative estimate that 2% oh, of the population were gay and lesbian. I see. Okay. It is more complicated math than... So, so what you believe the data, the facts of the data are, are that 5% of homosexuals in Belgium are married. Yes. Compared to 47%, I believe it was, of... 43%. 43% of heterosexuals. Okay. Now, Dr. Peplau, you would agree that there is a significant difference in the percentage, assuming, assuming this hypothetical that these facts are correct and that the math is, is correct, um, you would agree that there is a significant difference then in the percentage of population that is choosing to take advantage of the institution of marriage in that country. Yes, and I would be struck by the fact that those data seem to be so different from analyses of the percent of same-sex couples in Massachusetts who have chosen to get married. And since I don't know anything about Belgium, one thing I might speculate about is that Americans are one of the most pro-family people uh, around. I mean, the Americans are enthusiasts of marriage, and so the rates may be lower in Europe, and I don't have any explanation for for why or ability to speculate. Now, if you would turn to tab 9 in your binder. This is an exhibit that's been marked DIX 2430. Your Honor, I represent that these are um, statistics from the government of Netherland, and um, Netherland very nicely uh, puts their statistics up in English, so I did not have to have these translated. Um, I would move these in evidence again as a self-authenticating government record. No objection to the doc. 2430 is admitted. <clears throat> and tab 10 um, is some additional statistics from the government of the Netherlands. Um, this has been marked for identification as DIX 1887. Um, these are statistics, again, on the number of marriages um, same-sex marriages, marriages and then same-sex marriages by year broken down um, in a table through 2008. Okay. And Dr. Peplau, without taking you through the math again, um, if we were to go through that same exercise with the same set of assumptions in this hypothetical that there were 2% of the population in the Netherlands were gay and lesbian and doing the math, um, if, if in doing that, um, we were to find that 8% of the population of, same, of gay and lesbian couples in, or gay and lesbian individuals, I should say, in the Netherlands are married versus 42% of heterosexual individuals. Again, that would be a, a significant difference in who's taking advantage of the institution, correct? It would be a, a fairly substantial difference, but I would have no way to understand or explain or think about what it's telling us. Dr. Peplau, do you agree that one of the purposes of marriage, both historically and today, is to increase the likelihood that children will not be born out of lead will not be born out of wedlock? By definition. I'm sorry? It, it, could you repeat that? I mean, if I thought that you said one of the purposes of marriage was to ensure that children weren't born out of wedlock, meaning outside of marriage. Yes. Is that one of the purposes? 
so that children that are born to, that are born from <laughs> sexual relations of men and women are born within the institution of marriage as opposed to outside of it. Where are we going with this, uh, Ms. Moss? Well, she's testified that gay and lesbians are similarly situated to heterosexuals, and I'm simply going to ask her if, in fact, they're similarly situated with respect to accidentally having children or having children out of wedlock unintentionally. All right, why don't you ask that question? Would you agree that gay and lesbian couples do not accidentally have children <laughs> No, I, I would really just comment two things about that. Um, one is that, except in places like Massachusetts, all children born to lesbians or gay men or raised by lesbians or gay men are out of wedlock because the government doesn't permit their parents to marry. But if your question is, can two lesbians spontaneously, accidentally, uh, impregnate <laughs> each other, uh, not to my knowledge. <laughs> it, it has to be planned. It has to be an intentional birth. Right. Isn't that right? I believe that's correct. And so for that specific purpose or that specific reason, gay and lesbian couples are not fungible with heterosexual couples, wouldn't you agree? Fungible is a funny term to use, but uh, I would agree that uh, same-sex couples do not have accidental uh, pregnancies. Okay. Um, now, Dr. Peplau, I'm going to ask you to turn to tab 11 in your binder, if you would. And this is the exhibit marked DIX 1230. Yes. Do you recognize this? Uh, yes, this is a book review that I wrote of a book by Esther Rothblum. Um, an and edited book, yeah. A, a book entitled Boston Marriages, Romantic but Asexual Relationships Among Contemporary Lesbians. Is that right? That was the title of the book, yes. Right. And in your book review, you wrote that a growing body of research suggests that asexual lesbian relationships are not uncommon. Isn't that right? Um, I would agree with that. I, I don't know if I would. I agree with the statement that we have documented examples of lesbian relationships that are not characterized by what the general public thinks of as sexuality, that is sort of genital sexual activities. And elsewhere I've written about the fact that sometimes we use definitions or criteria for sexuality that are based on male sexuality, kind of assuming if there isn't a penis involved or a genital contact of some sort that it's not a sexual activity. And one of the things that some lesbians report is that other kinds of activities that might have a sexual component, such as cuddling or kissing, are things that, that they value, but that genital sex may not necessarily be a part of their relationships. Your Honor, I would move DIX 1230 into evidence. No objection. 30 is in. <clears throat> Now, Dr. Peplau, um, you're not presenting yourself here today as an expert in the social meaning of marriage, are you? That's correct. And I, by well, I think. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the social meaning. Well, I'm referring to how the public views marriage. Well, I have cited data, uh, for example, from the Gallup poll saying that uh, a very large number of Americans either are married or tell you that they'd like, they're planning to get married at some point. So in that sense, yes, but I'm not a, a sociologist and I have not, uh, you know, conducted studies in which I uh, have tried to assess 
the attitudes of Americans about many different aspects of marriage. Although, you know, in, it, the more we talk about it, the more it, it really kind of depends. I have done studies on people's attitudes about the division of labor in marriage and things like that. But the, so, if by social meaning you mean the sorts of things sociologists might do, I'm not, I'm not by training a sociologist. And, you, and you've offered various opinions on how you think the public views marriage and understands marriage, but you've not conducted any polls or any research into that specific topic, have you? No, I've relied on, uh, on other sources of empirical data and theory about it, and the Gallup poll is just one example of things I've relied on. And, and we've already established that you have not done and are you have not done any research into the relative benefits of domestic partnerships as compared to either same-sex marriage or heterosexual marriage, correct? I have not done that empirical research, no. Okay. And the only empirical research study that you've pointed to regarding the benef beneficial effects of marriage on same-sex couples is the Massachusetts survey that you referenced. Yes, I have drawn conclusions, of course, based on a much broader uh, liter set of literatures on same-sex couples and on heterosexual couples and theories and so on. So I'm really drawing on, uh, you know, a, a great knowledge base. But in terms of studies specifically of the effects of uh, same-sex civil marriage, I've relied on the uh, Ramos et al. paper. And so let's let's talk for a little bit about that study. Sure. I believe you said on direct and you recognized it's not a representative. It did not come from a representative sample. Isn't that right? That's correct. And by that, what do you mean when you say it's not a representative sample? Um, a representative sample would mean that it was uh, reflective of the entire population. So if, um, if we wanted to do a representative sample of uh, couples, we would typically try to find some way to access uh, a list of all possible uh, couples in a certain category and then to sample every fifth one or whatever. It would be a representative sample. This was a volunteer sample of people who uh, were contacted and chose to reply. And the researchers themselves acknowledge it and I acknowledge it. So it really is telling us about the opinions of 550 or thereabouts people who got married in Massachusetts and there may be different opinions or similar opinions among the rest of the people who did not get informed about the survey or chose not to answer. Well, and we know, and in fact we know a little bit about how they came up with the sample for the survey, correct? I mean, we know, for instance, that this particular survey was recruited through a large gay rights advocacy group in Massachusetts. Yes, my understanding is that this survey was done online, that it was an internet survey, and they went to a group that had a large email list, um, and they assumed that among that large email list there would be some uh, individuals or couples who had gotten married, and that was uh, the way the Department of Health of the state of Massachusetts chose to collect information. And so it was individuals who responded, individuals from this email list of this gay rights advocacy group who responded and who, who self-identified as being in a marriage that were sent the survey and the data was gathered from, those, from their correct. survey responses, correct? And we know from the survey responses that these volunteer sample members who responded um, that 40% of them listed as one of the top three reasons why they got married was having society know about gay and lesbian relationships, correct? I'm not sure that's the wording. I thought the wording was about legal recognition, but it's been a while since I've looked at that specifically. You may be more up on this than I am. Well, if you turn to if you turn to um, tab 12 in your binder, yep. and this is the Williams Institute survey, I believe has already been admitted 
in evidence on your direct? Yes. If you look at page five. Yes. Um, the, the authors of the survey say that, and I'm looking at the second full paragraph in that left-hand column, second sentence, it says, four in 10 reported wanting to have society know about lesbian or gay relationships. Oh, I see, it's the societal visibility that and then, we're talking about. Exactly, and then okay. in the chart next to it, it says it represents 40% societal visibility of gay and lesbian relationships. Okay. So that was one of the top three reasons for why they got married of 40% of the respondents of the survey. You would agree with that, right? Yeah, I would note they were asked multiple reasons, and the first reason that was given by virtually everybody, 93%, was love and commitment, and the second was legal recognition of their relationship, and then they give other answers, and you're, you're quite right that 40% of this unrepresentative sample said that social visibility uh, was uh, one of the reasons for them. And some of the ways in which the sample was not representative um, is that it was 90% white. Isn't that right? Yes, I don't actually know what the, what the demographic characteristics of lesbians and gay men in Massachusetts are. That is, I don't know what percentage of lesbians and gay men are in fact white or not white uh, in the state. So I, or in the United States? In the United States, it's certainly not, the United States is not 90% white. And the average age of the individuals who responded was 48 years old, isn't that right? Right, and again, um, yeah, you know, I don't know, yeah, I, I don't know what to make out of that. I mean, that was what they found, right? And that, that average age is significantly higher than the average age of most same-sex couples in the United States, isn't that right? Um, I'm trying to, th you know, there, there may be data from the census about what the average age of same-sex couples is in the United States, but I don't know what those data are. I really don't know uh, how to make the comparisons that you're driving at about was this sample relatively older than the gay and lesbian population of Massachusetts or not. I don't know the answer to that. Now, we also know from the survey results that 85% of the respondents had at least a college level education and 57% of the respondents had a graduate level education. Isn't that right? Right, and those levels are high. Lesbians and gay men on average have higher levels of education than the general public, but um, I think these are probably higher. And we also know that 52% of the survey respondents earned a combined household income of more than 110,000. Isn't that right? And you know, when we say a sample is not representative, part of what we mean is that it differs, or it might differ, it has the potential for differing from uh, a fully representative sample of the state. And that's really why when I talked about these data, and, and I hope I was very clear about this, I was not trying to generalize that these would be the experiences of every uh, lesbian or gay man who got married in Massachusetts, but rather that this tells us about the experience of some citizens of Massachusetts who were married. Fine. I think that's what you can claim based, I think that's what you can say based on this study.